Baybars famously, in, in, when he conquered the last of the Crusader castles, he found that one of them was empty and the ruler was, was missing. He said, where is the ruler of this, this domain, this area? He's not here, he's away in, in residence on holiday. And he had a letter sent to him, a letter pinned out and sent to him. It said, we had come, we had conquered, and you were absent. But for your benefit, we shall describe to you what you would have seen had you been here. Had you been here, you would have seen your army decimated, your soldiers beheaded. Had you been here, you would have seen, and he went into this long seven page explanation of what he would have sent, what he would have seen had he come back. And he said, our sincere advice to you, if you would like to see these events firsthand is to return to your castle. But if you would prefer to hear about it only by word of mouth and writing, it is best for you to remain where you are on permanent holiday. And obviously that ruler didn't return because he wanted to not witness those events firsthand. Now we have deaths during this time. Deaths during this time. You have Abu Mu'ali al Zabidi, who was a great Shafi'i scholar, and he taught using the methods uh, that had been handed down by Imam Abu Hamid al Ghazali. Rahimullah. He died in 656. Now, when Imam Abu Hamid al Ghazali, rahimullah, when he died in 505 AH, the Shafi'i scholars around him sought to synthesize the means of what he had written and to be able to teach it in a systematic pattern. So you'll find the scholars that will be in Yemen or Indonesia or places like that, they'll have this Ghazali curriculum where they will go through either the whole of Ihya Ulumuddin or they'll take sections of it and really concentrate on those sections. And this is sort of this Ghazali worldview of making people that share attributes of Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali. And that will be how people use Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali's books from the big Shafi'i ulama. This is what they, what they tend to do. So he was one of the ones that used his methods. Another was Zakiuddin Abu Muhammad al-Munviri. He's the writer of at targhib wa Tarheeb. This is a famous hadith book. at targhib wa Tarheeb includes a hadith within it. Targhib means to give people encouragement and to spur them on. And that tends to have a hadith about good things. Being good to your parents, the virtues of the paradise, the virtues of good manners, the benefits of the paradise, the beauties and what you're going to see in the paradise. Tarheeb means to warn people against or to put fear into people, right? It's the same place where we get our word irhab, which is to put fear and put terror in people, irhab. That has to do with a hadith that have to do with warnings about judgment, impending punishment, Allah's wrath, Allah's justice, Allah's might, Allah's power, Allah's judging, right? Allah being the judge of judges, the king of all kings, the one who solves all disputes, the one who punishes, the one who gathers the hypocrites and the unbelievers in the fire for all eternity, where his wrath shall abide forever, right? These things are tarheeb. And he gathered that under one heading as a book that can be taught in seminary. First of all, the sciences of a hadith are in that book. And then secondly, there are points to memorize of creed, manners, morals, fiqh, other things like that. So he was, he was a genius in doing that. You have Abu al-Hasan Ali ibn Abdullah ibn Abdul Hamid al-Maghribi. He is known as Abu al-Hasan al-Shadli, the teacher of those today who claim a Shadliya, this, this tariqah. Abu al-Hasan al-Shadli is coming from al-Maghrib, this, this Moroccan area, this horned area of Africa. His methodology was one of sobriety, Abu al-Hasan al-Shadli. His methodology was one of sobriety, Contemplation, fikr with dhikr. That means contemplating and dhikr. Fikr with dhikr. This was his way. And some people saw that his way was so strenuous they used to get worried for common Muslims that might try to follow him. Because they thought his way really is better for a student of knowledge or a scholar. But for a common man to try to take that, it could harm their deen because some people are weaker than others. 
But other ulama said, no, leave him because there will be some common Muslims strong enough to bear what he's teaching. And obviously Allah will guide those to him who are meant to be guided and those who are not Allah will protect them. So there was some dispute, not about whether Abu al-Hasan al-Shadli was, was upon Muslim orthodoxy or not, but whether or not they should advise people towards him. So people would come and say, should I, what do you say about Imam Muhammad, uh, Abu al-Hasan al-Shadli? They'd say, he's a good man. Should I study with him? They'd say, no, not you. Not you. Not that you shouldn't study with him, but not you. Because you're not ready. And then others would come and they say, yes, you. Because you have different ulama that are different capacities that some people can't deal with. For example, everyone can take from Imam al nawis al arbain al nawiyah Everyone can take from that. It's a book on Hadith. He's made it very easy. He's the people's imam. Everyone can take from that. But some people have to be told, don't study from, uh, don't study from Imam, uh, Imam Atufi. He's a great scholar of usul al fiqh, everything else. But they'll tell you, don't study from Imam Atufi. Why? Because he's not a scholar. No, no, no. Imam Najmuddin Atufi is a great alim, but you're not ready for him. You don't understand the usul that he's going to come with. He is called the genius of usuli scholars. He's on such a different level. You'll find. Out of 10 people that study him, only three people understand him. Three people will understand him because they try to study him by themselves and they don't understand him in his full capacity as who he is. So when they try to study him, out of 10 people, only two or three will really see, ah, I know where he's going. I understand where Imam Atufi rahimahullah is going. And people, you'll find people will tend to quote him in English for, say, lax fatawa on certain issues. But they don't realize the areas that they think are lax in, he's actually strict, but they haven't looked at his whole usuli premise that undergirds it. And because of that, they misunderstand, they nullify their wudu, or they nullify their salah, which in turn, if they keep rebelling, they couldn't nullify their shahada because they don't pay attention to these usuli people. Certain people, no matter what you can, you take from Imam ibn Hajj al-Asqalani, no dispute about him. Take from anything you like. But then some ulama, you have to be careful, not because they're deviated, because they're at another <coughs> level of knowledge. Imam Mahfud al Kalwadani. I mean, subhanAllah, you, you could take eight, it could take eight pages just to give commentary on, say, a couple of lines from his book Al Hidayah. Because he's he's someone, you know, he was giving fatwa in all four schools. He's just at that level. You have to be careful. Because you could lead yourself astray. And that's why you have to look at these ulama carefully. So Abu al-Hasan al-Shadli is one example. He's someone that certain people don't introduce him to. You know that so-and-so's got problems with this, he's got problems with that, he's kind of lazy about a salah. If you try to introduce someone strong like that into the equation, yes, and he used to do this, and he used to do that, they'll say, yes, it's impossible to practice this now. I might as well just go back to raving and doing what I was doing because Islam is impossible to do. Because they'll look at him as an example and say, I can't do this. Islam is just impossible. But other people that are strong, you introduce him. And they say, Subhan, that's where I need to be. That's what I'm going to do. And they start building up and getting stronger. You have to be careful, though. And so you have to be careful sometimes which ulama you introduce people to. You then have Shu'la. Abu Abdullah Muhammad ibn Ahmed ibn Muhammad ibn al Hussein al Mosili, who wrote the famous commentary on the Shatibiyah. You have Abu al Muhasin Yusuf ibn al Jawzi, who was the judge who took the Khilafa of the Tariqat al Qadiriyah from Sheikh Abdul Qadir al Jilani, and he was killed with three of his sons by the Tatars in 656 AH. So, all the people that I mentioned. So, this Imam, Imam Abu al Muhasin Yusuf ibn al Jawzi, took the Khilafah from Shaykh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani in the Tariqah. In terms of the fiqh, the creed, the understanding of Ihsan, he took Khilafah from him. Now this is a very important point. <clears throat> I mentioned this before, and I think it's significant. Anyone who claims lineage to Shaykh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, rahimahullah, in a capacity of Tariqah, if Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali or Shamsuddin ibn Qudama are not in their Senate chain, they're lying. 
I'll just be as straightforward as I can. If anyone claims tariqah lineage to Sheikh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, anyone, and Shamsuddin ibn Qudama rahimahullah, who is the nephew and successor of Imam Muwafiquddin ibn Qudama, and Ibn Rajib al hanbali rahimahullah, if anyone claims lineage to it through them, if anyone claims lineage to Shaykh Abdul Qadir al Jalani in the tariqah sense and they're not in the chain, that person is lying. They're either lying or they've been lied to by the person that told them. Because these are the khulafa, the later khulafa of it. This is one of the khulafa. Abu al Muhassan is unbelievable in terms of his knowledge. Unbelievable. Now, Shaykh al Islam Abu Abdullah al Yunaini. Abu Abdullah al Qudai. They both died in 658 AH. Abu Abdullah al Qudai was a famous scholar of Andalus. He wrote a hadith collection that is some printing houses have it as two collections, some uh, two volumes, excuse me. Some have it as one big volume. You'll sometimes look in some old books, I mean, going back hundreds of years, and you'll see someone state after a hadith, Ruahul Qudai. It's been narrated by Qudai, right? That's him. He's very strong in hadith. So just because you say, oh, I've never heard of him. He's not from the six. He must not be very strong. No, he's strong. And what he did is he wrote commentaries on different collections and would sometimes combine between them and draw out the meanings in them. He was a very remarkable scholar from the city of, from the city of Valence or what they're saying now, Valencia. All right? Al Izz ibn Abdul Salam dies in 660A H, great Shafi scholar. You have another, Ali ibn Wahhab ibn Muti' uh, who died in 667A H. He's known as Ibn Daqiq al Eid al Maliki, one of the great scholars. He had a son who's also called Ibn Daqiq al Eid. But this Ibn Daqiq al Eid is the big Maliki scholar. And his rank was so great they said that they said of Ibn Daqiq al Eid that he is one of the guiding lights of the Ummah for his time Ibn Daqiq al Eid he's a massive figure if you study Usul Fiqh or if you study the science of Hadith and his name doesn't come up someone's not teaching you Hadith or Usul Fiqh that's like studying Usul and Imam al Ghazali's name doesn't come up. That's crazy. Or studying like Ihsan or Tasawwuf and Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani is not mentioned. That's that's insane. Someone someone's not teaching you properly. If you study these things, Hadith or Usul al Fiqh, Ibn Daqiq al Eid's name, either one of them has got to come up. He's one of those people that his name will be mentioned. Because of his strength, because of his dedication, because of his knowledge, because of the depth of his argumentation, he's got to be mentioned. He's got to be. Another is Abu Muhammad al Mursi, 669 AH. He's one of the successors of Abu al Hassan al Shadli. All right, he's one of his successors, contemporary to his. Another is Abu Abdullah, Abu Abdullah Muhammad al Khazraji al Qurtubi. Great Maliki scholar and author of the famous commentary Al Jami'u li Ahkam al Quran. Let me tell you about Imam al Qurtubi. He is called, some people, he's so famous they just call him Imam al Qurtubi. This Imam, he died in 671 AH. He's from Qurtuba, what they're now calling Cordova. Imam al Qurtubi, Rahimullah. Al Khazraji, because he's from the Khazraj, from Medina. He's from the Khazraj. He's from the Sahaba from the Khazraj. He studied at a very young age, memorized the foundational texts of Maliki fiqh. It is unknown because the historians differ about whether he met Ibn al Jawzi. Either Ibn al Jawzi came to Andalus or he came to Baghdad. But what they are sure about is that they were contemporaries of each other and they knew one another. They either met either through uh, correspondence or by physical contact because there's an awful lot of cross-pollination between them. Especially Imam al-Qurtubi's knowledge of comparative creed. 